Amen. Okay, let's uh, open up our Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. We'll hit two chapters this evening. And then next week we'll hit the other two chapters and then we're done with the, the book and we'll head on over to the Song of Solomon in a couple of weeks. So I'm excited about that song. But tonight we're here and <laughs> I'd like to say that that the theme of the message is death is at the end. Is it the end? Is it all that there is? Now, as I said before I prayed, the most important thing, the most important part of God's plan is that eternal salvation. And we know a lot of people that don't know the Lord, that haven't given their hearts to the Lord. And because of that, if they were to pass away, they would spend eternity in hell separated from God for eternity. And how many relatives do we know that are in hell right now with Hitler, Stalin, Goliath, the Philistines, and many of those murders, Jack the Ripper, and many others. How many are there for eternity? I don't know if you've ever thought this, but I think of some of the loved ones that I know that are probably there. I think of my father, who is more than likely there, unless some miracle that I'm not aware of, and I pray that some miracle happened, but it doesn't seem to be. I mean, I'm not going to be deluded by by my heart and trying to comfort it, saying that he is when I don't know if he is. But... If I was God, and if there was a possibility, I would probably, you know, let them suffer a little bit, just so they know, and then just annihilate them, right? Just annihilate them, so they don't exist no more. At at least they wouldn't be in pain for eternity, in hell, burning, and so forth, you know, where the worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched, you know. Just annihilate them completely. How many of you ever thought that? You know, it'd be nice if God just annihilates them all. But that's not God's plan, right? That's not God's plan. God's plan <laughs> is, is so, so much more just and righteous that He doesn't annihilate them. And it's a reminder to those that, um, that know the Lord of that righteousness and justice of God. Well, Solomon is dealing with that same question about death because he observes things in life. And he takes the view from the humanistic view of life, you know, Uh, and many of us do because of where we were born, the way we were grew up, the culture that we live in, you know, the relationships that we've had, the hurts and the pains and all those things. We take all that stuff and then we create this truth around us, what we think is truth, because that truth will what protect us, we think. Because I've been through all this, so I know I don't do this or I don't allow this. And so I'm protected and I'm protecting myself from those things. And so we create this truth and, and we all do that. You know, we create relationships, relationships hurt us. So then we put up walls so they don't hurt us anymore. You know, um, Solomon has seen these type of things in, in men's lives. And so then he makes certain conclusions that if these things are true, not just in the righteous, but also the wicked, then, and then what are we here for? What's the whole purpose if, if all these things are the same for all of us? Yeah. Of course, we know differently because we have the truth, the word of God. Solomon observes that there doesn't seem to be much difference between the wicked <laughs> and the righteous. And you look at the church and you kind of say, okay, I could see Solomon's point of view here. or higher today in divorce rates in the world. That's not Christianity. And yet, in Christianity, (coughs) just as high, if not higher, than the world. What's the difference? What's the difference? Well, some would say that maybe they're not really believers. Because they're not committed to their relationship. They're not obedient to God's word in their relationship. And so... You know, you really can't count them because true believers would not get divorced. True believers would not, you know, leave their spouse for unbiblical reasons and so forth. So you can make that argument. But not just marriage, but culture, sin, 
<coughs> vices and various things. Is there a difference between the church and the world? <coughs> there should be, right? There should be a difference between our lives and how we live our lives than the world and how they live their life. We should definitely stick out like a sore thumb in the workplace and in the places that we go. And so Solomon has this idea that all things come alike to all men, whether wicked or not. And so he talks a lot about death here. So let's keep that in mind, death. That's the ultimate end in his eyes he sees, that everything's going to die. <coughs> Once you're dead, that's it. No more. You're annihilated. You're nothing. Uh, you know, he's going to say at one point it's better to be a, a, a live dog than, than a dead lion. And then you think of a lion's strength and power, but it's dead, so there is no strength or power there. So it's better to be a dog alive than a, than a lion. So <coughs> you see his perspective and view. And that's not true, right? That's not true at all. <coughs> so death happens to all. <coughs> Boy, I hope I can make this. I'm sorry I'm <coughs> still under the weather. So, Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 9. It says, For I consider all this in my heart. Now, again, he's observing. Remember, here's King David's son who, who asked for wisdom. And got that plus riches and wealth and power and status. He's living during a time of peace. This is a time where his wisdom brought peace to the nation Israel. And so if you can imagine a world of peace where he's ruling and there's enough jobs for everybody to work. They said at the time there was so much gold that you couldn't even... Uh, it was just piles and piles of gold and silver ten times as much, if not a hundred, you know, and brass and all these things. Just prosperity everywhere. And so he had the time to just sit back and contemplate his heart. You know, just think about things. You ever do that? You just sit back and you just start thinking about things. You know, you might be laying in bed before you go to bed. And so you start thinking about things and it keeps, keeps you up for a couple of hours and so forth. And that's what he's doing. So he says, so that I could not declare, or so that I could declare it all, that the righteous and the wise and their works are in the hands of God. And that's true. <laughs> that's true. You know, everything's in the hands of God. He's sovereign. People know neither love nor hatred by anything they see before them. All things come alike to all. One event happens to the righteous and the wicked, to the good the clean and the unclean. Uh, so he's talking about all people, whether Gentile or Jew. To him who sacrifices and him who does not sacrifice. So whether you believe in the Levitical law sacrificial offerings or whether you don't believe in them. <coughs> as is the good, so is the sinner. He who takes an oath as he who fears an oath. So he notices something. He notices something about the righteous and about the wicked, that all things come alike to them. Now, the New Testament tells us that it rains on what? The just and the unjust. Life is life. And things happen to us in this life. Uh, we get hurt. We fall. Financially get struggles. We have difficulties. Uh, just as the wicked does, so does the righteous. So there are those things that we go through that just happens to be a part of the fall of man. Uh, the thorns that were brought in. Uh, to the world because of sin, you know, the pain and the suffering and birth and so forth. And so there's the truth there. But he says, as he continues on, this is an evil in all that is done under the sun, <coughs> that one thing happens to all. Truly, the heart of the sons of men are full of evil. That's true. Madness is in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. Now, now he's starting to bring about his subject on death. See, one thing is truly saying here is death comes to us all, right? Nothing can help us escape from death. You know, in the end, we all die. Uh, we may die at different times. You may die young. You may die in middle ages. Or you may die a lot older. Or you may live to be a hundred and something. And, but we all die eventually. Solomon is dead. He's not with us any longer. Physically, that's true, right? And he's correct that we all die. But is it true spiritually? No. We die physically, 
but we do not die spiritually. We die once and we're appointed into judgment, the Bible says in Hebrews. But we die and we stand before God. Now, there is a second death that takes place. And that second death is when we are, when we are judged based upon our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And if we don't have that faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then we suffer the second death. Revelation talks about it about four times. Chapter 2, verse 11 it says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. So there's a second death, spiritually speaking. Those that are believers don't suffer the second death. We just suffer the physical death, and then we're in the presence of the Lord for eternity. Revelation 26 is blessed and holy as he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. We have part in the first resurrection. And the second death has no power over us. Why? Because we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. In his blood, right? Nothing but the blood of Jesus can save us. And so it's his blood that we put our faith in. It's not our works. It's not our righteousness. It's not our intellect. It's not our knowledge. It's not what we think is right. It's what the word of God says is right. And we put our faith and trust in that. And because of that, we don't suffer the second death. 2014 says death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So the second death is the lake of fire where, where Satan, death and Hades, those that were sentenced to hell and damnation will be. And then Revelation 21, 8 says the cowardly. Listen, listen to this list. He says the cowardly. Now, now why would he say cowardly? The unbelieving. The abominable, murderers, sexual, immoral, sorcerers, idolaters. I can understand the rest, but cowardly. What is that talking about? The cowardly. You know, those who are cowards. Not willing to take steps of faith, ventures of faith. They coward back. They get scared. They're timid. You know, and so forth. Those that aren't willing to take the gospel and preach it. Those that are ashamed of it. What did Jesus say? I'll be ashamed of you. The cowardly. And he goes on and says, <clears throat> their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is, again, the second death. And so, in a sense, he's correct. Physically, we die, but spiritually, we don't. Now, he's still confused here because he thinks that once you die, that's it. Notice in verse 4, but for him who is joined to the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. Now, there's that, that phrase I mentioned earlier. So, for those that are joined with the living, we're, we're, there's hope for us because we're still alive. And so, we can enjoy certain things. See certain um, <coughs> observations in people's lives. Joy, happiness, and all those things. At least we're alive. And there's hope when you're alive. But if you're dead, there's no hope for you. Even if you're as strong as a lion, there's no hope for you at all. For the living know... That they will die, but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So his view is, once you die, not only are you forgotten by the loved ones, because as they die, they forget who you are. I don't know who my great-grandfather is. I don't know if you know who your great-grandfather is, or maybe your great-great-great-grandfather. I have no idea. Forgotten, forgotten, don't know him, you know. But not only are you forgotten, but you're gone. You're annihilated in a sense. There's no, there's no more of you is what he's saying here. And there are groups that take this scripture here and they use it for their doctrine, like Jehovah Witnesses. They don't believe in a hell. They believe in annihilation, that God just is going to annihilate all the unbelievers and they will no longer exist and there are even some christian churches that believe the same thing we know that it's not true right we have the perfect example in luke chapter 16 of the rich man and lazarus where we see that after death we see this whole story of a rich man one in abraham's bosom one on the other side of the lake and how they're talking to abraham talking about jesus coming you know and resurrecting from the dead and how, you know, 
the plan of salvation is all set and so forth. So we see Jesus giving us that example or truth, interpreting the Old Testament, and Solomon not seeing that. So uh, Solomon's not a guy that you want to really believe in the book of Ecclesiastes. You don't want to really listen to what he's saying. He's confused at this time. See, what happens is when you start observing things, and I've noticed this in my own life, <clears throat> that things can become mundane. For instance, for me, when I used to work, I used to think every day I've got to get up at a certain time, 5.30. I've got to go to the gym and work out, and then from there I've got to go to work. And then I get out of work at 3.30, and then I go, go home, I've got to put on my work clothes, and I've got to work in the yard. And that was a routine for me you know, almost every day in some form or another. Of course, we had our fun time, but it became a routine. And eventually you start thinking, is this all that life is? <laughs> you know, is that you get up, you go to work, and then you come home, you go work in your yard, then you go back to sleep, and then you get up again. And you can think that way, and pretty soon you're saying, you know what, nothing matters then. I don't, I don't care anymore. You still do it because you have to eat, and you want to find some hope in life. And have some fun, so you do it because you want to make some money so you can go eat sushi and have a good time, you know, and, and so forth. But you really have no hope. A person doesn't have any hope that way, whether it's your job or whether it's even church. Are we going to be this size all the time? Is this, is, is this it? You know, is, is this the whole picture? Is this why God created me? You know, and so forth. And I think we need to change our mindset. Because it can become mundane, and you can look at life, and you can see one man, you know, I think of John starting with us, and now he's gone. Is that it? All those years? Is that all that we have in our relationship? You know, no. Because I remember John coming in here, you know, a, a skeptic as any other skeptic I've ever known, and believed in God, but didn't have uh, Jesus Christ as a personal Savior. And through years of teaching and and some of you that have known him just as long as i i, I have known him <coughs> he's very persistent and wants to know answers and you know eventually he uh he found those answers you know i don't think he minds me sharing this with you when he first came here he really didn't like gangbangers and he was just like really get on me so how can you teach to these gangbangers a bunch of no good guys and all they do is drugs and you know have fun and just tattoos and oh, you know and he just didn't have this love for them you know and i says but john god loves them he died on the cross well yeah i know that you know and so forth but eventually <coughs> i've seen him grow to love a lot of you gangbangers you know a lot of you guys that got tattoos and stuff and you know i've just seen that and that is where the hope is is when you see a life changed eternally. And that is where the focus is. That is where the focus is. Um, I'm going to share this uh, at our annual event, but just real quickly. <coughs> I love sharing the gospel with people. Always have. And I have never been ashamed in, in not sharing it or in sharing it. But I've never really pushed it on people. I've always looked for opportunities that God would give us to, to open up uh, someone's heart. Well, on Christmas Eve, we're all at uh, my son's house, and everyone's having a good time with uh, Christmas Eve and eating and all the different soups and so forth. And a friend of mine Facebooks his me, messages me, you know, happy, you know, happy New Year, you know, that, that type of thing. So then I just started talking with him, and I'm going to share more on, on that day. I'll actually do some reading. But it was just amazing. Because I spent the whole New Year's Eve not socializing with all of you, but messaging her on Facebook. And you know what happened? She accepted the Lord by the time we were done on Facebook. That made my day right there. I said to Virginia, I'm ready to go home. I mean, that's why I was here for, you know, just to sit down and spend some time doing that. You know, that's the hope. That's the purpose. One more soul now gets to go to heaven. Yeah, I may come here every Sunday and preach and not see it, but it came on that day, and it was worth it for that one person. You know, 
And we need to keep that focus on eternal life. That's the whole purpose and plan of God. When we focus on the externals, when we focus on our situations, yeah, there's no hope. There'll never be any hope. You know, you'll never find it that way. It's only in Jesus Christ. He goes on, also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Moreover, they will they have a snare or, or a share in anything done under the sun? So again, teaching that annihilation. You know, their love has perished, their hatred, their envy they just don't exist anymore. So enjoy life. Notice verse 7. So go, eat your bread with joy, drink your wine with a merry heart, for God has already accepted your work. So in other words, just go enjoy life. Enjoy life, get drunk, enjoy as much as you can because tomorrow you're going to die. I mean, we all think that way. The world thinks that way. Get it now, right when you can get it, you know. It's Miller time. You know, you spend all week. It's Friday. Let's go out and party. You know, we can take that same attitude as believers. I worked all week. It's Friday. Let's go out this weekend. Well, what there's a... We're going to go evangelize on Saturday. No, no, no. I worked all weekend. Let's go out and have some fun and unstress ourselves. Yeah, but the gospel is going to go out. Oh, I know. Let someone else do that. You know, and we get off the focus and we get it on ourselves because we think we deserve it, you know, because we work so hard. And in reality, you know, we're not fulfilling God's plan. We're not fulfilling the purpose that he's created us for. We're just eating, drinking, and enjoying life. That's not why we were created. Not at all. Let your garments always be white and let your head lack no oil. So in other words, slick your hair, put your rags on, and get out there and keep up the appearance and have a good time. Live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life, he says, which he has given you under the sun all your days of vanity. For that is your portion in life and in the labor which you perform under the sun. That's your portion. For some of us, that's good. For others, maybe not so good. (coughs) Your wife isn't going to fulfill you or your husband. Virginia didn't know this, but I was spying around in her desk today, and I found this note that she had written. I don't know when, because it doesn't have a date, and I was looking for a date, but it was a prayer of hers for me. You know, I don't know if she gave it to me, and I just forgot or what, but I was just reading it again, that she was praying, and this is what the Lord told her. You know, and, and I just read the whole thing, and I'm like, wow, that's pretty neat. Right there, right there made my whole day. We may not be able to do other things like we used to, but knowing that I have a partner that's spiritually in tune with me, that prays to the Lord, that seeks the Lord's will, isn't perfect, but her heart is for God and for the ministry and for the work of God. That right there makes it worth it. And there are some that aren't. Their portion in life is a little harder because their focus isn't on God. It's on self. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you're going. So again, you see that mentality he has. We're just going to die. I I return and saw under the sun that that the race is to the swift, nor the battle to the strong nor bread to the wise, nor riches uh, to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill. But time and chance happen to them all. So what he's saying here is that we're all like in a big lottery. In other words, you're just lucky. You know, luck happens. Things just happen. It's just time and it's just chance. Is that true? No. We have a God that has a purpose for our lives. Not true as true at all. He said in Jeremiah twenty nine eleven, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. God has good thoughts towards us, thoughts of peace and not of evil, of a future and a hope. That's true. It's not just time and chance. I, oh, I just got lucky I got the job. Really? You're lucky you don't have a job. It has nothing to do with luck or time or chance. 
It's God's sovereignty. It's his will. He is in control. Well, how much control does he have? He has total control. I don't understand how it works because he also gives us free will. And we make choices, don't we? Whether we want to submit to his will or not submit to his will. But he has a perfect plan for us. And that perfect plan includes his plan. And when we fulfill that, he will bless us, multiply us, and pour his grace upon us. That's something we don't, <coughs> we don't grasp. So you can't go wrong being obedient to God. You just can't. We miss out on so much because we're not obedient to his word. What do we miss out on? Yeah, I know. You know, I can't tell you because you haven't done it. If you did it and then you got it, then you'd see what you could have missed out on. But because you're not obedient, you're missing out on what God really wants to do. Even in the midst of struggles and financial crises and, and so forth, when you're obedient to God, he has a way of blessing you. He has a way of blessing you beyond what you can even imagine. But we limit him. See, what happens is we, we quench the spirit. Paul talks about quenching the spirit. First uh, Thessalonians, right? What does quenching the spirit mean? When we quench the spirit, the spirit of God wants to move in a great way in our lives. He wants us to grow in Christ. He wants to share the gospel. He wants us to mature and so forth. He's going to teach us, guide us, and lead us. He'll lead us to the right places, through the right doors. He will direct us and guide us. He'll protect us. But what happens is when we begin to quench the spirit, in other words, <laughs> stop obeying God's word or half-heartedly obey God's word, then the spirit is quenched. He can't work as hard because you're not allowing him because of your lack of obedience. And so he can only work so much. And so you only have half as what God wants for you instead of all of what God wants for you. And so a lot of us walk around struggling all the time. You know, if you're struggling, I'll guarantee you you're not obedient to the word. I'll guarantee you you're not obedient to the word. And when I'm saying struggling, I'm just talking about struggling with your faith in God. Where's God? How come he's not here? Why isn't he working in my life? Blah, blah, blah. These type of things. It's because you're not obedient to the word of God. If you are obedient to the word of God, God would be working in a great way way in your life because that's who he is and he wants to work that way he has a future and a hope for man also does not know his time um, we don't but we're not like fish taken in a cruel net like birds caught in the snare so the sons of men are snares in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them no we know god's in control we know that the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. So he notices this great wisdom. And there's great wisdom. And he esteems this wisdom, honors it in verse 13 through 18. This wisdom I have seen, not also seen under the sun. And it seemed great to me. There was a little city with few men in it. And a great king came against it, besieged it, built a great snare around it. So the city... Little tiny city, and this king came up against it, you know, brought his men, besieged it, took it over. And he noticed this, this thing in verse 15. Now, there was found in it a poor, wise man. Notice that he's poor and not rich and not powerful. He's a poor, but he's wise. He's wise. And he, by his wisdom, delivered the city. Yet no one remembered that same poor man. Then I said, wisdom is better than strength. Wisdom gave them victory over this king. So wisdom is stronger than strength. Having wisdom, what's wisdom? Wisdom is understanding and knowledge applied. You can have understanding, you can know truth, but if you don't apply it, it does you no good. You have to apply the wisdom to your life. You can know Christ died on the cross for you. You can know that his blood can forgive you. But until you, of your own free will, accept that and then choose to turn from your old life and start walking a new life, you're not going to have the power until you decide to do that. You will continue to live without wisdom. Oh, understanding. 
and knowledge, but no power because you don't apply it to your lives. And it's almost like God says you've got to take that step of faith. And as you take the step of faith, boom. Remember when the children of Israel <coughs> were going to cross the Jordan for the second time? And they had all the people and it says, well, the waters are there. Maybe divide them again. And so they were hoping that he would divide the waters again. And says, no, 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 that's not what's going to happen. You need to take a step of faith. Start walking in the water. So they literally had to get their feet wet. So as they're starting to walk in the water, that's when all of a sudden it began to divide. And that's what God wants from us is to first walk and then watch what he does. We're the opposite. We want to see him do it and then we're going to walk through it. You know, but that's for young believers. <laughs> that's for the Israelites coming out of Egypt. You know, they were so scared. Let me open it up and then walk through it. But no, now you've been through the wilderness. Now you've seen the power of God. Now walk by faith. You get in the water a little bit and watch me do it a little harder, a little harder to do. But wisdom can really overpower strength. Then I said, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> how many preachers have preached the truth of the gospel? You know, and there's so much wisdom there, but people despise it. Oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Oh, obedient to the word. Yeah, right. You just you just want something from us. You know, oh, no, it doesn't work. You know, Really? You're despising wisdom and you're despising not my wisdom, but God's wisdom. And that's what's sad is that people would despise God's wisdom and say that it doesn't work by not, by not doing it. And that's what you're saying, right? That doesn't work, God, so that's why I don't do it. And what you're saying is, God, you don't know what you're doing. I do, and so this is what I'm going to do. And a lot of people do what they want to do. But again, they they are not experiencing the full power of God. <clears throat> Words of the wise spoken quietly should be heard rather than the shout of a ruler of fools. <clears throat> Wisdom is better than weapons of war. But one sinner destroys much good. Boy, the power of a sinner. Okay, then we come to chapter 10. Now, chapter 10 is a little different in that he actually has a good chapter. And there's some good principles here that, that he, he <coughs> shares with us. A few we need to be careful of. But, but for the most part, a lot of little parables here that he gives us or, 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 or little thoughts of wisdom that we can glean from. So, um, so up to this point, you know, he's talked about wine, women, money, philosophy, education, and you know, all the vanity that all goes with that, and he's still struggling. And then we come to the folly <coughs> that is despised. And so here he says, dead flies uh, putrefy the perfumer's ointment and causes it to give off a foul order. So does a little folly to one respected for wisdom and honor. There's a saying. So, you know, you purchase an expensive bottle of perfume and then a dead fly you know is laying in it and you go Ugh, i'm not going to put that perfume on so is a person that has honor and esteem when he begins to be foolish and it's amazing how many people will do thumb dumb things you know uh, grown men who act like children you know, they don't grow up they still want to be kids and so you're 50, 60 years old, but yet you still want to be a kid. And so you dress like a kid. You drive around like a kid. You act like a kid. And that's foolishness. You know, here you're to be esteemed and honored and lifted up, and yet you're doing foolish things. And I think of the politicians and some of the foolish things that they do at some of these gatherings, and they get busted. You know, They spend the taxpayers' money. They go to Vegas, and they're doing all these stupid things because you know, they want to be kids. And here are those that be esteemed and honored and they're doing dumb things. I can remember working for Edison and I would hear about management. And they would get together and they would go to uh, weekends to motivate one another so that they could do a better job, right? Well, their motivation is doing silly things, you know, like wearing tutus and running around and feeling free, you know. You've got to get loose and you've got to give up your inhibitions and stuff so that you can rule and lead right, you know, and this kind of stuff. And it's like... Really? Whatever happened to old-fashioned being a respectful individual? 
You know, using wisdom and honor. He said it's foolish. It's foolish. It's like a dead fly anointment. A, a wise man's heart <laughs> is at his right hand, but a fool's heart at his left. Okay, what does that mean? Right hand, the wise man, the left hand. <coughs> Chuck didn't know. Chuck don't know. I don't know. <coughs> uh, John Corson <coughs> said that, and you do find this in Scripture, usually the right hand is, is the hand of power and might, right? And, of course, <coughs> it's speaking of the heart and the right hand. So with the heart, you're doing you know, the work of the Lord the, with the power of the Lord and so forth. And maybe it's with the left hand. You know, it's the other guy that's foolish in heart because he's really not doing much there. So, um, I don't know. Or the right hand of God, I don't know. You can you can decide what you want it to say. You know, I I just, I know what it says, that a wise man's heart is in his right hand. That's what it says, and that's the truth. What does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> but it's true. Even when a fool walks along the way, he lacks wisdom. And he shows everyone that he is a fool. I mean, he doesn't have to wear a sticker on his forehead, right? I'm a fool. You know, hey, look at me, I'm a fool. No, you just watch his life and you know he's a fool. Because he's always doing foolish things. You just know those people. <clears throat> those are the guys you want to you wanna kind of grab and say, Guy, grow up. Grow up. Stop doing those foolish things. You lack wisdom. If the spirit of the rulers of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your post for conciliation pacifies great offenses. So this is true. I mean, it's better to just turn the other cheek, Jesus said, right? Why fight against it? You know, um, I like my son's philosophy. We're here to serve whatever you want. We're here to serve. We're just going to do it. You know, and, and that's a great philosophy to have. You know, why kick against the goat? Why fight against, you know? God has <clears throat> set <laughs> those leaders in our country, our nation, and our cityhood and so forth. Why are we fighting against it? Uh, we need to just go along with it as long as it doesn't uh, come against God's word, right? And we'll talk about that on Sunday a little bit more. It's interesting because... Just this last week, I was on my way here to church <coughs> a couple weeks ago, and I was on Limonite, and I was on the right-hand lane, and I was late, <coughs> and so I'm like, oh, i got to get into the left lane, right? I'm getting up to the light, and so I see there's two cars next to me, and I'm like, the car that's next to me, I'm, I'm just a little bit ahead of them, and so forth, and the car's right behind them, so I knew I couldn't slow down and get in, so I had to speed up. Well, this is a young kid, and he didn't like that. So I put my blinker on and I sput up. Well, I noticed that as I began to come into the lane, because I sput up enough that I passed him, he spun up because he got mad. And so all of a sudden I look and he's on my tail and I'm already in the lane and he's honking. He got so mad he went into the oncoming lane, went back in and cut me right off, you know, just boom like that. And I'm just like, okay. And I, I can almost see headlines, pastor in a brawl in the middle of the street, you know, and I'm just like, okay, Lord, that's the only thing that stops me at times, because I'm just like, what? you know, and, and, and this is this thing, all of a sudden, we both eventually turn, and so he rolls down his window, so I roll my window down, I don't know why, I roll my window down, <laughs> and I'm like, ready to say something, and he says, why do you all of a sudden jump into the lane? You had plenty of time to way back there, and you should have done it back there. I'm like, dude, you want to drive? I'm just like, you know. It's like, what? I put my blinker on. You saw that I was coming in, but you know how people are. You turn your blinker on, what do they do? Speed up so they don't let you in, and that's exactly what he was trying to do. And it was just like, oh. You know, and I thought about it exactly what's here. Just yield. Just yield and let them, you know, and that's eventually what I did. I just said, whatever, rolled my window up and just, just went out. Now he knows where I live. <laughs> so if I go missing, you know where to <coughs> send the police. <clears throat> it's just amazing because we have so much pride, we don't want to yield. We don't want to yield. My, my wife has taught me that so much because she has yielded for so many years to me. It was just yielding. And that is so hard for us to do, right? 
is just to yield. See, we can't trust God enough to know that he knows what's right and what's true. He knows what's wrong. We can't trust him enough to know that. And we can't trust him enough to say, you are my defender. You are my redeemer. No, we've got to handle it ourselves and not yield into it. We've got to take control of it. No, God lifts up the humble. He lifts up the humble. And that's why my wife is going to get so many more rewards than I am going to get. Because she has learned to yield. And she's taught me that. Where now I'm learning to yield to her. It's difficult. I understand. It's taken me years to learn that (coughs) characteristic. But it works. And we need to yield to authority. We need to yield to government. We need to yield to one another. You know, we need to yield because it is true what Solomon is saying here. There is an evil I have seen under the sun as an heir proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity. While the rich sit in a lowly place, I have seen servants on horses while princes walk on the grounds like servants. Again, I'm, I'm not sure what he's saying here. <laughs> could be talking about his own servants. Um, he, here he is, the richest man in the world, but yet his servants on their horses. And maybe he should be on horse. I'm sure he, he got on a horse. He who digs a pit will fall into it. Now there's a truth. You want to dig a pit for someone? You want to set a trap? You end up falling into it yourself. And whoever breaks through a wall will be bitten by a serpent. Be careful that you're not setting traps for people because then you get trapped. And this is God's word. This is wisdom. You want to hurt someone? Who really will get hurt? You will. Well, what if they never find out? Look, God knows. That's who knows. He knows what you're doing. He knows your heart. Do you think he's going to let you go by? No. It just isn't going to happen. (laughs) He who... Quarry stones may be hurt by them, and he who split wood may be endangered by it. (coughs) If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. So what an analogy. You want success? Use wisdom. Use what he's been saying to us. Use what the word of God says. Obey it. Otherwise, you're like an axe that is dull. Try to cut wood with a dull axe. Don't work too good. What do you have to do? You've got to hit the wood harder in order to cut it. And you're not going to really cut. You're going to what? Dent it. You know, and you may dent it to death until you finally break it. But sharpen the axe. Oh, wow. I never thought about that. Sharp axe. Really? Yeah. Watch how it just cuts it right off. That's wisdom. That's wisdom. I like what John Corson said that, that oftentimes... <laughs> in ministry, we think that we need to push our way to success. And we're like a dull axe. We're just pushing it. It takes all this strength and work and power. He says, when in reality, we just need to sharpen the axe and let the Spirit of God just slice through it. Let Him do the work. Let Him get the glory. I love it when that happens. A serpent may bite <laughs> when it's not charmed, the babbler is no different. <laughs> you know what a babbler is, right? Someone just likes to talk and 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 talk. And just on any subject, talk and talk and talk and talk. Eventually, people just like tune them out. They're like, and then they've never really heard a word that they're saying. <clears throat> Here's wisdom. Don't talk so much. Yeah. Be quiet. <laughs> the words of a wise man's mouth is are gracious, but the lips of a fool shall swallow him up. The words of his mouth begin with foolishness, and the end of his talk is raving madness. A fool also multiplies words. No man knows what is to be. Who can tell him what will be after him? The labor of fools weary them, for they do not even know how to go to the city. Woe well, to you, O land, when your king is a child, and your prince feasts in the mornings. Why do they feast in the mornings? Because they got a hangover. Woe to us when your president goes to Hawaii and spends most of his time there. 
And because it's just all about partying and having a good time. And that's what they're, they're there for, to enjoy life on our expense, you know. But blessed are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobles, and your prince the feasts at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. That's maturity. That is maturity. That is somebody who says, I have a responsibility to this great nation. I have a responsibility to this church. I have a responsibility for my ministry. It's not just to have a good time. There's a responsibility that I have that God has entrusted to me to oversee the things that he has given to me. And I'm not here just to enjoy life at the expense of others. Because of laziness, the building decays. And through idleness of hands, the house leaks. That is so true. I like what Chuck said. Maybe some of you businessmen need to take that and put it, put it as a plaque in your employee's lounge. Right? Because of laziness, our buildings decaying. Don't be lazy. Nobody likes a lazy person. Literally, nobody likes a lazy person. We used to have a, a guy in our, at our job, and he was lazy. He's just a lazy guy. But he knew when to work. He always worked when the boss was around. And he'd work hard. But when the boss left, he wouldn't work hard. We had to move from Alhambra to Westminster. So we're packing everything. And the whole time, they had the radios on, people packing and stuff. The whole time, he's just walking around talking to everybody. Then all of a sudden, the boss comes in, and he starts moving around. Of course, the boss is calling everybody to come and sit down so he can talk to them. Well, he keeps working. He keeps working. And all of a sudden, the boss looks at him and says, hey, no, come over here, Joe. Sit down. Relax. And all of a sudden, he, the, immediately, the boss says, boy, I wish I had a lot of guys like him. And everybody just started laughing because they know he's lazy. And it's just a show. You know? It's just a show. <coughs> Don't be lazy. Do your job. Work hard for the glory of God, and God will repay you. He promises that. A feast is made for laughter, and wine makes merry. But money answers everything. Boy, is that true? That's one of the statements that's not true. Money does not answer everything. John Corson said that there are, these are the words of a fool. How do you know if you're a fool? Well, is drinking important to you? Is drinking important to you? It's important to a lot of people. A lot of Christians. I see it on Facebook. These are Christians that we know. And they've got their margaritas. And they're posting it out there. Stumbling people and so forth. Is drinking that important to you? That you don't care about stumbling other people? Then you're a fool. That's what it says right here. You like partying? Partying is a priority. Going out, having fun a priority over the work of God? Then you're a fool. How about money? Is money a big issue with you? If you don't have enough, you don't save enough, if you don't control it enough, is that a big issue for you? Then your God is money and you're a fool. Who's the one that provides for us? God does. He takes care of us. He's the one that meets our needs at all times, not us. Not us. I used to I used to bug people, you know, when I first realized that I don't provide for my family. I don't provide for my family. Who does? God does. I don't have the ability to provide for my family. Well, wait, don't you work? Yeah, I work because God's given me the strength to work. But it's God who's given me that strength. Well, but what kind of job did you get? Well, I got this kind of a job. Well, didn't you have to go to school for that? Yeah, but God gave me the, the mind to understand those things. Otherwise, I couldn't understand them. God is the one that provides for us. I, I would tell that to guys. Actually, I tell that to women because women need security. They need stability. They need to feel like their husbands are providing for them. And see, I, I understand that, but it's, it's wrong. Their husbands can't provide for them. It's God who provides for them. God. Because sometimes husbands can't work for whatever other reasons. And, and so I have to try to somehow convince them you're looking to the wrong person. You're looking to the wrong person. And that's why you're struggling. Because it's God who provides for us. Now you start putting your faith and trust in God and then watch how he begins to provide. Because he is faithful when you make him faithful. But John Corson says, congratulations. If you put so much emphasis on these things, you're a bona fide fool. 
<laughs> do not curse the king, even in your thoughts. Do not curse the rich, even in your bedroom. For a bird of the air may carry your voice, and a bird in flight may tell the matter. So that's where we get that little, that little saying, right? A little bird told me. Right? Do you think people really keep, keep secrets? <laughs> they don't. This is bad. I know they don't. Now, when I work for Edison, and <coughs> not only do people not keep secrets, but people who tell you, can you keep a secret? They've also told that to ten other people. So when you go tell it, they never know it's you. Because they know they've already told ten other people. See, we can't keep secrets, and we can't even keep ourselves from telling the secrets that we want people to keep. You know? And that's our problems. That's our struggles. That's why we get in these situations, because we're out there telling all these things, instead of just keeping it to ourselves. You know what? <laughs> Best person to talk to? God. He hears it all. He knows it all. You take it to him and you leave it in his lap and say, Lord, you can take care of this. I know you can. And I don't have to share it with anyone else because you're God and you're my God. And I have a personal relationship with you. And I know that you love me and you care about me. And there are promises that you have for me and you're going to provide. And so I can totally just lay these things before your throne and know that everything will be okay. And you won't have so many problems with people going around saying this and that and this. Believe me, I hear it all the time, all the time. I hear the little things here and there because little birds are flying all over the place, <laughs> saying little things all the time. If not there, it's on Facebook or Twitter or somewhere else, you know, and what you just said, can you keep a secret? A thousand people just read it on Facebook. So keep a secret for real. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your word. <clears throat> Father... <coughs> Will you give us a different perspective, Lord? Will you help us to see that you are our God and that you have a purpose and plan for us within your plan, Lord? And that this life on earth is not about just food and what we drink and what we eat and what we wear, Lord. There's more to it than that, Father. It is the plan of God, the Great Commission, Lord, to be a part of that, to see someone saved, to see someone come to know Jesus Christ, in a fresh and a new way, Lord. May we get busy about the gospel this year, Lord. May you open up doors and give us opportunities, Father. May be able to walk into people's hearts, Father, and just really get to the matter of things, Lord, and just share with them the love that Jesus has for them, Father. Lord, may you fill us with your Holy Spirit and equip us, Father, for the work that you have for us, Lord. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.